You know, this morning has been different for me. Um, I uh, stayed in the back, and normally I'm out here always listening to the music. But I knew the message that I was going to bring today is a weighty message, and it may be one of the most important messages that I've ever preached in our church. And uh, sometimes when you're in the middle of the sermon preparation, you get this feeling that it just has a certain weight to it, uh, if that makes sense, that I just know that what I'm going to be sharing is going to impact a lot of lives. And this morning is been one of those mornings, and I'll explain as we go through it. But we're in a series right now on the life of Paul. He was Saul of Tarsus, and then he has this dramatic conversion experience where he becomes a Christian, he becomes a believer, and instead of persecuting the church, he now becomes a preacher for the church. And so the transformation there is just uh, absolutely incredible. And so we're going to take his life, and we're going to look this morning at the way God used three things that are things that most of us just do not want to experience in our life, and yet God will take these things and he will use them in a great way if we're willing to give it over to him. Now, I have a fundamental belief that was expressed beautifully by a gentleman named Alan Redpath, who is a preacher and a writer, and he once made this statement, and it became foundational to my spiritual life. He said that he believed that there was nothing that ever touched his life that was not filtered through the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That there was this sequence that would take place. That everything that he was facing in life, everything that he was going through, it had gone through this filtration system of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so when I think about that, I think about today, the way that God uses three things that most of us really do not want to experience. One of them is silence, another of them is solitude, and the last one is suffering. For some people, they try to avoid these at all costs. You know, we'll, we'll turn on the radio, we'll turn on the TV because we don't want to hear silence. Uh, we like being around people, and so sometimes we avoid solitude because we just want to be in company with other people. And of course, today, you know that one of the number one emotional issues facing people with mental health is that there is a fear of being alone, that aloneness. And, and yet God uses silence and God uses solitude. And then the third one we can all identify with because who really welcomes suffering in their life? And yet it's something that all three of us are going to experience. So years ago, there was a preacher who greatly impacted my life, still does today, and his name was Ron Dunn. And Ron Dunn just had certain ways of looking at Scripture that I would sit back and just marvel. I would go, how in the world did he see that when I've read that passage a thousand times and I never saw it? And things would just jump out. And so he was at my church and he was preaching and uh, he preached a message that was called God's Strange Ministers. And he talked about the ministry of suffering. And when you think about that, that's a, it's a hard thought to be able to think about because you think, well, how in the world does God use suffering to minister to us in our lives? Unless we realize that the reason that God ministers to us in our life is so that we can minister to others. And as a preacher once told me, and I shared last week, if you preach to hurting people, you will never lack for an audience. So today, I want to expound on what Ron Dunn said because I want to talk to you about three strange ministers that God uses in your life to be able to minister to you, especially if you subscribe to the belief of Alan Redpath that nothing ever touches our life that's not been filtered through the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so the power of silence, the power of solitude, and the power of suffering will result in a greater awareness 
of the Spirit and the presence of God in our life, and it will take us closer to God than any other three elements. And this is outlined in Matthew chapter 10, verse 27. As many of you know, my youngest daughter, Abigail, uh, works with me and helps me to formulate messages and gives me different insights than I would ever have into Scripture. And some of that has come through some of the suffering that she's gone through in her life because she's battled chronic kidney stones, just had surgery about two weeks ago now, and uh, had to go in emergency surgery and have a stone blasted. And so she's suffered with these things uh, at, to such an extent that it's pretty uh, unreal at times. And she adopted a verse that she made me more aware of, uh, of and it's in Matthew chapter 10, verse 27. It is a powerful verse. And here's what it says. I will tell you in the darkness and so that you can tell it in the light. What I tell you in darkness. In other words, we're all going to go through dark times in our life. We're maybe a, a dark time in our health. Maybe it's a dark time in our marriage. Maybe it's a dark time in our career. Maybe it's a very dark time in your finances right now. And he says, what I tell you in darkness, and, and that's key, because you and I cannot avoid dark times in our life, and even though the darkness is all around us, the darkness does not have to get inside of us, because he says, what I tell you in the dark, because there's going to be times that he's going to whisper things to you in the dark that he could have used a bullhorn in good times and you would have never heard his voice. But he's saying there's going to be those dark times. That, that's those silent times. And he says then one day you're going to be in the light and you'll speak about it in the light. But there's times that you need to be quiet when you're going through things in the dark as God begins to formulate and begins to give you wisdom and he begins to give you grit and he begins to give you resilience to be able to take on whatever you've got to face in life. So he said, then one day you're going to speak it in the light. And what you hear whispered in your ear in the dark times, in the solitude times, in the suffering times, those three things become ministers in your life to help you become a minister to be able to minister to other people that are going through those times in their lives. Because Paul said, no one can comfort those who are suffering like those who have suffered. There is a certain level of uh, just, you know, qualification. There's a certain level of, okay, Okay, you've been there, you've experienced this. And then he goes on to say, and then what you hear whispered in your ear by God in those dark times of silence and solitude and sometimes suffering, one day you're going to proclaim them on the housetop. And the whole thing is to give you this image of going through the dark times when you're by yourself and you're insulated and you're isolated and you're in silence and you're in solitude and suffering. And God is saying those three ministers are going to speak to you in that time. They're going to whisper in your ear. And one day when you get in the light and when you get on top of the housetop, you're going to have a message that other people want to hear because there's a valid foundation to what you've gone through and what you've experienced. And that's why you hear me say a lot of times, it's one thing to tell your story up on the housetop when you're in the light. It's another thing to live your story when it's dark and when you're hearing God whisper to you in those times, but one day you're going to be able to tell the story. That's why you need to do, when you're in the middle of the dark times, you need to live your life in such a way that when you tell your story later, you don't have to change a thing. And so you live your life now the way you want to be able to tell your story later. And you remember last week I told you, whatever you are in private with God is going to get revealed in public. And that you will never rise above in public that which you are 
in private with God. And that the longer you spend on the front end of getting your life in alignment with God, is going to be directly connected to how confident you're going to be on the back end of that decision. You know, you can pay me now or you can pay me later. And so you pay up front. And so what I call those years are the silent years and the solitude years. And in the Bible, you see God's different people going through those silent times. You see Moses spending the first 40 years of his life in Pharaoh's household as the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter. But he turns around and he walks away from all that when he had a terrible experience in his life and he sinned by killing someone. His heart was right on what he, his intentions were, but his follow through was terrible. And so for 40 years of his life, he went went from the palace to living out on the backside of God's desert. But then God realigned him in those 40 years of silence and solitude and probably suffering and then uses him to go back and to bring his people out of Egypt. And so God had a plan for him. And sometimes we can find our lives on the backside of God's mountain. And you see a Nehemiah that was down in Babylon for years. But I think the one that always stands out to me is the life of Jesus. Because, you know, from the time that he's about 12 years old, and he has that experience down in the temple when his parents lost him on their trip back home to Nazareth, I'm sure that was a moment in the life of Joseph and Mary for the next marriage conference, how we lost Jesus, right? So... Jesus shows up there, he's 12 years old. You don't see him again till he's 30 years old. And not only do you not see him again till he's 30 years old, but he only has three and a half years of ministry. And sometimes you sit back and you think, why in the world wouldn't God have brought him out earlier? I mean, why wouldn't have God have used him to have, you know, 20 years of ministry rather than just having three and a half years of ministry? And so what God is doing in those times is he's creating that waiting room for us. And can I tell you something about waiting? Waiting time is not wasted time. You should never wait the time in waiting, nor should you ever waste your grief. Find a way to be able to use your grief to be able to help others. And so there is a way to actively wait because God never wastes anything in the life of his servants. So last week, toward the end of my message, I talked about the ministry aspect that silent years can play in our lives. And I also told you that it's something that most people try to avoid at all costs. Well, the Apostle Paul was told up front in advance, here's some of the things you're going to go through. Because he's blind, he's at this house on a street called Straight, and Ananias is told by God, go there, pray over him. Right now he's blinded, but the scales are going to fall away. This is your mission, Ananias. And Ananias knew that Paul was a persecutor of the church. He knew that he had letters from the high priest to be able to go there and to torment these people and to bring them back in chains to Jerusalem to try them for blasphemy. But Ananias could hear God's voice. And God said, go there and I want you to pray over him. And then the Lord said to him, this is in Acts chapter 9 verses 15 and 16. The Lord said to him, go for he is a chosen instrument of mine. And here's how God is going to use him. He's going to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings, in other words, political leaders, and the sons of Israel. For I'm going to show him how much he must suffer in behalf of my name. Now, I want you to think about that. God is telling him up front in advance, so here's your, your deal, Saul of Tarsus, who's now going to be Paul the Apostle. There's going to be these times of silence, solitude, and suffering. But they are going to minister to you. They are some of the most unusual, most unwanted ministers that ever come into our life. But I'm telling you, it is so vitally important. And when I'm talking about silence, I'm talking about 
that voluntary time, that temporary absence of speaking, it's not silencing your mind. Solitude is a withdrawal for the privacy of spiritual reflection. And so having those extended times with God is vitally important. And Jesus is a perfect example of that. Three different times in his ministry, it said he pulled aside from everyone and he went and he was alone with God. But you say, I, we live in a very busy society. We live in an extraordinarily connected society. So how can I take time to do that? Well, you know, I started out in church as the janitor and the youth director. And I used to teach my kids to have something called a DQT, a daily quiet time. That every morning, first thing when you roll out of bed, or for some of you before you roll out of bed, that you have a quiet time. That's why being able to do a devotional with Zig Ziglar yeah, that's called Daily Insights, that was such a, a treat for me because I wanted something that that people could have 365 days a year and they could take it and they could read it and set aside you know that five minutes in the morning to just simply have a daily quiet time but there's other ways that you can enhance it for instance not only have five minutes as a daily quiet time but then at some point during your morning and I do this every morning I do it every afternoon I find at least one minute where I can take a deep breath and I can just sit there and relax myself and focus on, God, what do you want to do in my life today? How do you want to use me today? So I consecrate a minute in the morning. I consecrate a minute in the afternoon. And then I always close out my day by praying. Because the Bible tells us this, pray without ceasing. And so when you start setting aside a time for a daily quiet time, and that moment of silence, that moment of solitude, two times a day, and then as you go to bed at night, it makes all the difference in the world. But there's also the extended time away. You know, a time where you can go to a different environment. It, it might be that you come here to the church and you just sit inside this building and it's a place for you to be able to pray. My first time that I ever remember doing that for an extended period of time, I was taking a world religion class in college and my assignment was to go and spend a weekend at the monastery out in Conyers. And so it's a place where solitude and silence are the most valued qualities. And so that was my first time to do that. I've done it multiple times since then by going to the mountains of North Carolina or going to the mountains of North Georgia and finding a time to be able to fast and pray and just focus on God, especially when I know that there's a major life change that's about to occur. I need to hear from God. And so the benefits of silence and solitude is you learn to hear the still small voice of God and your alone time will strengthen your resilience because, you know, you're resting in him and it will give you emotional healing just to pull away and it will create a greater sense of self-awareness for you. And it allows you to do deeper reflection and to have spiritual surrender to God. Now, some of you ladies are going, sounds like like a spa weekend to me. Well, I don't want you to go to the spa. I don't want you to be hearing from them. I want you to ha find a way to be able to hear God's voice and not just other people's voices. Here's why. Silence will sharpen your goals. Silence will give you clarity about your future. And solitude then helps you to strengthen your own voice rather than just hearing the voices of everybody else around you. But there's no question that there's never been a harder time to find silence and solitude than there is today. So I see the value of silence and solitude there, silence and solitude. And so what God does is Paul experiences this amazing transformation, but he doesn't go back to Jerusalem and immediately begin to preach. As a matter of fact, he goes to a place that we call Arabia, and depending on which writer that you read about Paul, I believe that he spent three years from the time of his conversion being in that time of silence and solitude. 
because he was investing on the front end so that he was going to be extraordinarily capable on the back end. And so he's going to spend that time in Arabia because eventually he's going to go back to Jerusalem and I'm going to read to you some of the things that he experienced during that time and why it was important that he knew that he was hearing from God because the next stage is suffering. Now, I believe there's three types of suffering, and there's probably more than this, but these were the three that came to my mind while preparing this message. You know, there's suffering that comes into our life because we live in a fallen world. We live in an imperfect world, and bad things can happen to good people because we live in fallenness. And Jesus even said to us in John 16, these things I've spoken to you so that in me you can have peace because in the world you're going to have tribulation. The world is an imperfect place. There's things like cancer. There's things like dementia. There's things like ALS. Uh, there's uh, all kinds of different things that can impact our life because we live in a broken world. It's not that someone did something bad. You remember the time that Jesus healed someone, and, uh, and when he did, they said, was it his mother or his father that sinned? And Jesus said, neither of them. It had nothing to do with this. We live in a fallen world. And then he tells us, now take courage because I've overcome the world. And then there's suffering brought on by misguided choices. In other words, we create our own mess. You ever heard the old saying that if I could kick the person in the rear end who's caused me the most trouble, I couldn't sit down for a week, right? Because we create our own mess. That's Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And then there's another type of suffering. And this is the one that Christians don't like to hear a preacher preach about. It's the one that comes about because we bear the name of Jesus. Because we've declared ourselves as followers of Christ. And in 2 Timothy 3, Paul writing to Timothy in verse 12 said, Indeed, all who want to live in a godly way in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. He doesn't say maybe, could be. He says we will be persecuted. And I tell you, today people don't want to hear an emphasis on persecuted Christians or the persecuted church, I think for multiple reasons. One, because it can be depressing and it can be discouraging to hear, well, you're going to be persecuted. You're going to have these things. Because when we leave church, we all want to be positive. We all want to be uplifted. You know, nobody wants to sit down at lunch after church and go, well, let's talk about persecution today, right? I mean, it's not a very positive topic. The second reason that people don't want to hear about it is people say, that scares me. It scares me to, to hear messages about the suffering or the persecuted church. And then some people just deny the reality of it. They say, well, you know what? I've, I've never seen Christians persecuted. It must not be going on. Well, let me tell you what, it, it is going on. Here's some of the realities. In our country today, there's a woman who's serving time in prison right now because she prayed outside of an abortion clinic. She didn't yell at anyone. She didn't attack anyone. She prayed outside of an abortion clinic, and she was sent to prison. There are people in this country that are being denied the opportunity to adopt children because they're of the Christian faith. And these adoption agencies are saying, nope, you're going to try to indoctrinate someone. That's going on right now. And there's people being taken to court because they're standing their ground on moral issues. And they're uh, encountering things like people saying, well, a child at 11 years old or 10 years old, if they want to transition and they want to become transgender, they should have the right. And it shouldn't be the parent's right to be working the child through a time like that and you're seeing children being taken away from parents those things are going on and hate speech applies you know you can't talk about any other religion except Judaism and Christianity and it's open season on Judaism 
If you're not seeing the things that are going on right now in the world and people with a stated objective, whether it was the situation right now in uh, Lebanon with Hezbollah that's embedded there and you're seeing the battles that are taking place and their stated goal is to annihilate the Jews and to do away with the Jewish state of Israel. I mean, that's your fundamental goals. You don't think that's persecution? And so we're seeing all these things. You might have also read about a pastor named David Lynn. Been praying for David Lynn for years. Uh, in the last two weeks, he was released from a prison in China. He spent 18 years in prison. You know what his crime was? He started a church. He started a church. He had it in his home. So because of that, he spent 18 years of his life. And according to the U.S. State Department, in more than 60 countries, Christians are facing persecution from their government or their neighbors because of this kind of situations. And I have a buddy named Johnny Moore, and Johnny Moore is a brilliant young guy, and he's written a book uh, around the idea of martyrs today, modern day martyrs. You know, you have the old uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs, which is kind of a standard book for anyone in the area of, of Christianity about people who've been martyred for their faith down through the years. Well, now you're having people martyred today. And so what I want us to focus on in the time that we have remaining is about Paul's suffering because you need some foundational truth. I need some foundational truth about persecution and suffering so that I understand it from a biblical point of view so that one day if I experience these things, I'm going to know how to be able to deal with it. And so Paul, if you want to read this later, if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he talks about all the persecution that he went through. And some of the persecution that he went through is so similar to what I'm seeing today in the presidential election. I, I'll, I'll explain to you uh, what I mean. Because Paul has to go and defend his apostleship against false teachers because false teachers have gone to the church in Corinth. Uh, Paul, during his lifetime, he traveled about 10,000 miles, it's estimated, and he established 14 churches. One of those churches is a place called Corinth. I'm going to be there in about five weeks. I'll be at Corinth. And they are destroying Paul's ministry, these false teachers. He went there and he set up this church, and now there were people coming in saying, oh, he's not a true apostle and what you need to do is you need to listen to us because we're the ones that have the truth and have you ever noticed everybody wants to claim truth as their own and so these false teachers had some criticism uh, of Paul's uh, one of the things they criticized him for is they said oh he writes great letters you know these letters that he's writing the churches but these things are weighty and these things are too strong and yeah he's well educated but you know what now I want you to think about presidential election his physical appearance is very unimpressive yeah, they started attacking him because of his looks. They started bullying him because of his looks. And you know what they attacked him on? Paul was vertically challenged. They said he's not very tall. Isn't that a great reason uh, to criticize somebody else? He's not, Paula, uh, not tall enough. Paul is not tall enough. And then they said his bodily presence is, is weak. He, he doesn't, he's not strong. And then the thing that they really got him on is his speech is contemptible. See, God created Paul to be able to write. He didn't necessarily give him the skills to be able to speak extraordinarily well. But yet, in spite of that, he's going to go out and he's going to speak. And the false prophets, they put a premium on how well can you verbally communicate. And they were saying, well, you know what? We're a lot better speaker than Paul is. So he's going through that type of rejection from other people who supposedly were believers. Then he's got religious rejection. They criticized Paul because they said, the Jesus that you're proclaiming is a more tolerant Jesus, you know. Uh, it's not, uh, he's not tolerant enough. In other words, 
Paul had established a church at Corinth, false teachers came in and said, oh yeah, y'all can do this and y'all can do that. They had a more tolerant Jesus and what it resulted in was immorality in the church. When you're reading First and Second Corinthians, that's one of the things that he's going in and that he's encountering with them and he's confronting it with them or your struggles with immorality. And so they said, well, Paul, you proclaim Jesus and we proclaim Jesus too. And then in his second letter, the Corinthians in chapter 11, he says, I'm fearful that you've moved to another Jesus and not the Jesus of the New Testament. You see, there are people who proclaim their faith and they'll proclaim their faith and they'll say that they're Christians and you look at their actions and you go, how in the world do you claim Christianity and you live life the way that you live it? And you do the things that you do. And so Paul's encountering all of this kind of stuff. Can I tell you something? When you stand for the truth, it doesn't make you a popular person. And people will rip you to shreds. Because if you confront their pet sin, then they become angry. Now you've stopped preaching and you've gone to meddling, right? And people don't like you meddling in their life. You would be shocked at some of the things that people have told me in the past that they say that God encouraged them to do. If, if it ever violates God's word, then it is not of God. God's will and God's word never contradict each other. I, I'm just absolutely telling you that. Then there were life's disappointments. And he was talking about all the things that he's been through in verse 23 of that chapter. He says, are, there, are they servants of Christ? Or am I speaking as if I'm insane and I'm more so? Because I've been in far more labors. I've been in far more imprisonment. I've been beaten with, at times without number, often in danger of death. And then Paul goes through this litany. I'm just going to bullet point it for you. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day adrift at sea. I've been on frequent journeys. I've been in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. I've been in toil and hardship. I've been through many a sleepless night. How many of you can identify there, right? I've been in hunger and thirst. I've often been without food. I've been cold and I've been in exposure. And apart from these things, he says, there is a daily pressure on me and I have a, an anxiety about all the churches that I'm called to take care of, these 14 churches that he had started. And he said, who is weak? Am I not weak? And he runs through all of these horrible things that he's gone through. And then you and I pat ourselves on the back and say, you know what? I came to church this week and it was pouring down rain. And the traffic was just terrible. Matter of fact, I had to wait eight minutes at Starbucks to get my steaming hot cup of God. I mean, you talk about tribulation. I've been through some tribulation, right? Paul said, man, I've been through persecution from false prophets, from the Jews, and from the Gentiles. So what's God's purpose in suffering? And for those of you who physically suffer, my wife is right over there. She physically suffers. She's had cages put in her neck because her vertebrae collapse on top of each other to the extent that sometimes she can't uh, turn her wrist. Uh, she has rods in her back. Uh, she's had surgery after surgery after surgery as different parts of her body. She has suffered. Now I told her, I said, today's message when I get to this part is for you because sometimes we want to believe if God's shining his favor on us, then I'm going to be good and I'm not going to have to suffer. And nothing can be further from the truth. You can be so in the center of God's will and your health be chaotic and your marriage be chaotic and just everything is chaotic that you and I need to be reminded of the biblical view of suffering so that when it happens to us, we're ready mentally for it 
and spiritually. The physical impacts the mental and the spiritual. And Jesus said it starts out with being attacked for what you believe. In John 15, verses 18 through 21, if the world hates you, you need to know that it hated me before it ever hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as, your, as its own. If you just went along with the world, but because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world because this world hates you. And people today, so many people hate Christianity. You know why? Here's their favorite verse. Doesn't the Bible say to judge not others? It sure does. But the Bible also says be a fruit inspector. Look at people's fruits and see if they're right or not. And remember the word that I said to you? And this is Jesus. A slave is not greater than his master. So here's his reasoning. If they persecuted me, Jesus then they're going to persecute you as well. If they followed my word, like the way that we follow the word of God, they will follow yours also. But all of these things they're going to do to you on the account of my name because they do not know the one who sent me. So what Jesus is really saying is, well, who do you think you are? I mean, you're not better than I am. And if I was the son of God, and I was virgin born, and I've lived a perfect life, and I've been out, you know, walking on water and healing people and feeling multitudes and doing all that. And if they hated me enough that ultimately they nailed me to a cross, then what should you expect? If you're going to be true followers of mine, do you think the world is just going to love you? Of course not. Because he says, you're not greater than I am, and a servant is not greater than his master. So expect that there's going to be seasons where you suffer. For it's been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but to suffer on his behalf. This is Paul's letter to the church at Philippi because you're experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here to be in me. So suffering is a part of our responsibility as believers. And here's what the early church believed. It's a privilege that we're suffering on God's behalf as followers. Because they were having their businesses taken away from them. They were being cast out of their, their homes. The spread of Christianity happened the way it happened because of something called the dispora, the dispersal. Persecution pushed the church out. And the blood of martyrs is what gave growth to the church and Christianity as we know it today. That's why it spread. God predicted it. The Apostle Paul says, it's going to happen to everyone who lives a godly life, and you're going to be tested in ways that you've never been tested before. So Paul tells us then in, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing as though something strange were happening to you. But to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing. Keep your peace. Keep your joy in the middle of suffering so that at the revelation of his glory, you may also rejoice and be overjoyed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God is resting upon you. So here's the deal. We need to expect it. We need to anticipate suffering, but we need to grow with it. Suffering is inevitable. Growth from it is optional. We have a choice in the matter. Is it going to make me bitter or is it going to make me better? Is it going to make me cold and cynical or will I become more compassionate and caring? And we get to make that choice. And the early church was going through things that the American church has not gone through. They were being thrown into prison. They were being beaten. This book in Philippians I read to you just a moment ago, Paul wrote that book from a jail cell. 
That's where he penned those words. And if you read the book, it's interesting. He's writing it to church, but not one time does he ever say, hey, pray that I get out of prison. Because you know what? Sometimes you and I, we, we pray and say, God, get me out of this, rather than praying and saying, God, help me to get out of this what I need to get out of this. So here's the big point on this. Did you know Jesus said that you're you're going to be my witnesses? Did you know that the word witness in the Bible is actually the word martyr? And what he's saying is you're going to be my martyrs. And so you see what happened so often when people believed in Christ in those days, they were martyred. And that's the word that you have in the New Testament today. You will be my martyrs. And so some people, he says, are not going to get to see the solution to everything they want to see in this world. And he writes about them in Hebrews chapter 12. And he has this long list of persecutions. And he said, you know, there were other people that were tortured, but they did not accept deliverance, meaning to deny Christ so they wouldn't have to suffer because they believed in a better resurrection. There were others that were stoned and imprisoned. There were some people, he said, that walked about with nothing but sheep skins and goat skins. They were destitute. They were afflicted. They were tormented. And he says about those people, those men and women of whom the world is not worthy. And he says they didn't necessarily see deliverance in their lifetime. And then the next important principle is in developing a theology of suffering, understand that suffering strategically positions us to be able to help other people. And it gives us an eternal perspective. We never know when we're going through what we're going through, how we are going to be able to help other people. You just never know. And it's our calling to suffer can I put it into real context for you this morning? In the last service, I had a couple come up to me at the invitation. And the father came over and he grabbed me. And his name is Harry. And his wife, Melissa, was with him. And you may have read the story this week on I-75. With all the weather, there was a wreck. And in that wreck, his daughter, Michaela Harshaw, was killed and they were in church this morning you know why they were here because their daughter came to know Christ here because Marlon Longacre baptized her right up there and they showed me the video of her being baptized because right now that's the only hope that they have to see their daughter again see what I talk about is real what I'm talking about can impact every one of us. They're, they're right now at a time of suffering. And, and Harry asked me, he said, would you have the church pray for our family? And that's what I'm asking you to do as I close today. See, this message was meant for them. But it's also meant for you, Robin. It's meant for others of you in this building that are battling cancer. As I get ready to walk out and setting the side, Nat Van Zant came over and just put his arms around me. And he prayed for me. And as I sit there, a message comes up. This is my niece, Julie. And her dad was my brother-in-law, Buddy Allison. Buddy and Becky were my first wife's sister and her husband. I've known them since I was, Buddy since I was probably 18. Becky since I was probably about 15. And there's not anything further they can do for him right now. And I asked you last morning to pray for me because I was leaving here to go to a hospital and that was the situation. See, they're suffering right now. They're hurting right now. And I'd ask you to pray for the Allison family. 
Because of having lost a wife and child, when I met with Harry and Melissa this morning, it wasn't empty words when I said, I know some of what you're feeling. Because I've been there. I often say when I do a funeral here, you never want to be on the first row. It's where family sits. And yet we suffer. And we have times of heartache. And you know what God says? We're to boast in God's comfort in the midst of our sufferings. And Paul says the most interesting things. He said, I, I don't want to talk to you about my strength. What I want to talk to you about is my weaknesses. You know why? Because there were times Paul was scared. He was frightened. He felt the physical pain of those beatings. But yet he says, if I'm going to boast, I'm not going to boast about my preaching and all the churches I've planted, all the letters I've written. I'll boast of the things that show my weaknesses. That's what I'll boast of. And then in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, he says one of the most important verses in the Bible for you and for me. You may not know this, but I promise you it's true. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is perfected in your weakness. And then Paul says, so therefore I delight in my weakness. You know the times that you get scared. You know the times that you get mad at God. Harry and Melissa talked about our first instinct was to be so angry. Their daughter was going to be getting married. Harry said, I started working an extra job to be able to raise the money for the marriage. I delight in weaknesses, in insults. Hey, you're too short. Hey, you're not pretty enough for this world. Hey, you're not thin enough for this world. In my distresses, God, how am I going to make the money stretch in my persecutions, in my difficulties, in behalf of Christ. Because when I'm weak, he says, I'm strong. When I'm weak, I'm strong. I put down some things to close this service. You know, for me, the fear comes uh, in the night. You know what my biggest fear is? I don't mind sharing with you. That I can't provide for my family. That's my single biggest fear. That I can't provide for my family. You say, now I know why you work two full-time jobs. Absolutely. That's, that's my single biggest fear. Because I was raised by two parents who went through the Great Depression. <laughs> and they scared me to death. My mother in particular. If things were going well, you know what my mother would say? Whew, you better hang on. Things are going too good. We couldn't enjoy the good. Because she told us something bad was going to happen. You know why my mother was that way? Because her father was a binge alcoholic. And they never knew what he was going to be like. Sometimes he would stay sober for a few months. Sometimes, you know, maybe for a year. But he would always revert back. So she learned to live waiting on the other shoe to drop. That's what happens to people who are raised in that kind of atmosphere. So she'd always tell me, oh, I'd ask to buy something <laughs> like a Coke. And she'd go, let me tell you something, big boy. The poor house is just around the corner. Yikes. Oh, I'm telling you something. There's a rainy day coming. And so I grew up with fear rather than the antidote to fear, which is hope. So what I have to do is I have to call on hope because struggles, suffering is inevitable. But my growth is optional in that. Health issues, strained family, a loss of loved ones. I mean, 
So you ever just feel like sometimes it's one storm after another storm after another storm? All these people that just went through the hurricane, all those people from where I'm from in Western North Carolina are suffering so badly. Pray for them right now. So many families haven't been able to get in touch with their other families because there's, there's no communication and all the bridges have been washed out. So many of the bridges, they're, they're isolated right now. They've gone through a storm and so Guess what the Weather Channel is saying? There's another storm brewing that's going to come through the Gulf. You ever just feel like that? But yet, within our Christian faith, there's a, an anchor. We're, we're, we're anchored in the veil to trust that God is there for us. There's a light that never dims, no matter how bad the winds of adversity are. We know. So hope, in a theological sense, is not a fleeting wish or some naive optimism wearing rose-colored glasses. Hope is not even built on the shifting circumstances that we see. Hope is built on the rock. The rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew. And yet that house withstood it because it was founded upon the rock. Hope is intrinsically linked to our faith. And it's not just a passive waiting for things to get better, but it's an active belief in the trust of God's plan, even when we can't see the plan. And it seems like God is still on the surface. That doesn't mean that he's not moving behind the scenes. So you know what Paul said to the church in Rome? We rejoice in our suffering knowing that suffering produces endurance, grit, determination, resilience, and endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. So Paul is saying there's a reality of suffering but there's a transformative power in hope. So he's saying whatever you're suffering with is not meaningless. There's a purpose. There's a plan behind it. It doesn't eliminate your pain, Robin. It doesn't eliminate the loss of your child, Harry and Melissa. But what it does do, it gives us strength to be able to keep going. And it lights a candle even when we're in our darkest moments because we find it in the character of God and God is faithful and God is true and he said, I will never leave you. I will never, ever forsake you. So you guys come and take this stuff. Well, I want us to pray together and I want to invite you to the altar. And I know that I've gone long but as I said, this may be one of the most important messages that I've ever preached because somebody may be watching online and you're, going, you're in the storm right now and you're going, how in the world am I going to survive it? And right now, you're going, it seems like I, I can't hear God's voice. Silence. I feel like I'm so by myself. Solitude. I'm suffering. Three of God's most unusual ministers will minister to you. I promise you. I have been in all three. Sometimes at the same exact moment. I've been in all three. See, nothing's ever going to touch your life that had not been filtered through the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the sovereignty of God. That's what I rest in, the sovereignty of God. I may not be able to understand everything, and that's why Isaiah 55, 8 is such a precious scripture. For my ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts, says the Lord. My ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than yours. God sees everything from an eternal perspective. He's God. Would you stand with me? Maybe today you want to bring those burdens down here to the altar. The song that Matt chose because of the message today fits so beautifully. Because there's times that we just need the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to hold us through whatever storm we're experiencing. If you've never accepted Jesus, just say, Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. 
I choose to acknowledge, God, that you exist. I believe on the name of Jesus. I confess my sins. I confess you as my Lord. Come into my heart right now, Lord Jesus.